Hi, welcome to this video on linear programming duality. In this video, we are going to see how one uses complementary slackness in practice. So, previously, when we had first introduced complementary slackness, we illustrated the idea by working with this example of this primal dual pair of linear programs given here. So the primal on the left and the dual on the right. And they both came with a feasible solution. So we had a primal dual pair of feasible solutions, x bar and y bar, as you can see. And not only were they feasible, we used complementary slackness to show that they were optimal. So that's what this comment is saying. Complementary slackness implied these were a pair of primal dual optimal solutions. But actually, as we alluded to in the video when we proved complementary slackness, there would have actually been an easier way to demonstrate uh, optimality of this primal dual pair. And that would have been to use strong duality. So what is strong duality saying? So let me switch to a marker here. So strong uh, duality, um, this says equivalently that for x bar, y bar being a primal dual pair of feasible solutions, x bar, y bar uh, is optimal. So by optimal, I mean, I mean they're both optimal. Um, if and only if um, c transpose x bar equals b transpose y bar, where uh, c transpose x, that's supposed to be the primal objective function, so I'll, I'll label that c transpose x, and b transpose y, similarly, that's the, the dual objective function, b transpose y there. So weak duality told us that when you take your two feasible solutions and you plug them in, if it so happens that they come out to be equal, then of course they must have both been optimal for their respective linear programs. But strong duality is saying even more, it's saying that if your solutions are optimal, then it will necessarily be the case that the values that they come out to be when they are plugged into their uh, objective functions are equal to each other. That must happen. And so what we could have done is we could have simply plugged in x bar and y bar into these objective functions and seen whether or not those values were equal. And if they were, then we had a pair of uh, optimal solutions. And if they weren't, then at least one of these two solutions was not optimal for its respective linear program. Um, so if we went ahead and plugged these in, what we would have found is uh, C transpose X bar here was minus 18, and B transpose Y bar uh, would have also been minus 18. And so since they were equal, then we could have concluded that in fact these were both uh, optimal solutions. And this simply seems like a much easier way of going about things than using complementary slackness. Uh, because complementary slackness, we had to write down all these conditions and we had to verify one at a time that all these uh, conditions actually held. So, um, in other words, what's the point? Why did we bother going through complementary slackness since it seems like it's just a more difficult way of verifying something that we could have more easily verified using strong duality? Um, so, okay, so that's effectively what this comment says. We could have already determined uh, that these feasible solutions were both optimal more easily by using strong duality. So why do we bother with the complementary slackness conditions? So that's what the purpose of this video is. It's to show you what we would actually use the complementary slackness conditions for in practice. And so what we would do is this. We would be proving the optimality of a single feasible solution. So let's suppose that we have this primal dual pair of linear programs given here, just for example. This will illustrate our intent. And not only do we have this primal dual pair, let's also suppose that we are given x bar this feasible solution here. So it is feasible. You can verify that for yourself. Just for example, the first constraint would be a 1 times 8 minus 5 times 1. So 8 minus 5 is 3, and that is less than or equal to 3. So uh, similarly, all conditions are, uh, all constraints are satisfied. So this is feasible, but our question is, is it optimal? Let's say we suspected that it was optimal, but we don't really have a way of proving it as, uh, as it currently stands. So how could we do so? And actually what we would do is we could use complementary slackness in order to prove optimality or lack thereof of this uh, feasible solution X bar. So what would happen? So here, here's what we would do. So we would have, um, we would have that these would be the complementary slackness conditions. So either there's a variable that's equal to zero, or the dual constraint, uh, associated constraint, is holding tight with equality. Now you'll note that um, x bar is, you know, something we already know. X bar is 
A5, um, but Y bar, um, that's not currently determined. So complementary slackness, if you recall, this is to characterize a primal to optimal pair of solutions. So we're determining whether pairs of solutions are, are optimal, but here I'm saying that we're going to use complementary slackness to determine if just X bar, just this one solution for the primal, is optimal. So what we would actually do is we would check whether or not we can actually find a Y which satisfies the necessary conditions. So there's going to be conditions outlined by the complementary slackness conditions which must be satisfied by a vector Y in order to uh, make X bar and this supposed Y bar a primal dual optimal pair. So first of all, let's just see what X bar uh, satisfies in terms of the complementary slackness uh, condition. So we can start by seeing that um, the components here are 8 and 5, neither of which are 0. So uh, these first two conditions say that either the components of X are 0 or the corresponding constraints are tight. And since the components of X are not 0, it must be the case that if we have any hope of proving that X bar is optimal, it must be the case that uh, these two constraints on the right do hold. So let me circle both of these constraints um, because these must necessarily hold for uh, any vector y which can be associated uh, to this vector x. Okay, and then also we have the constraints that correspond to uh, the vector y and the dual constraints in the primal. Um, okay, so what that means is either the components are zeros or the constraints for the primal are tight, and we can plug in x-bar and determine which constraints are in fact tight for this x-bar. So we've already done so for the first constraint. We said it was 8 minus 5, which is 3, which is exactly equal to the right-hand side. So uh, that first, uh, that, that third constraint down below uh, will hold tight with equality then for this X bar. Um, but how about for the next constraint? Well, what would happen is we would have, um, uh, we would have eight, 1 times 8 minus 3 times 5 is minus 7. And that is less than or equal to 3, but it is, it's, of course, strictly less than 3. So uh, what that would mean, then, is this constraint down below would not be satisfied using the x's. So we would have to resort to the y's to compensate in order to make this condition actually hold true. So it must be the case, then, that y2 is equal to 0, um, since it is not the case that x1 minus 3x2 holds tight with equality equal to 3. And then finally, uh, we can look at the last constraint. We'll have minus 1 times 8 plus 2 times 5. Uh, so minus 8 plus 10 is 2, which is exactly equal to 2 on the right-hand side. And so we can circle the bottom constraint down below. And so what we've just done is we've just outlined the necessary constraints uh, that Y must satisfy. So suppose that we find a Y that does satisfy these constraints as outlined by the complementary slackness conditions then provided that that y is also feasible for the dual linear program, then what we've just done is we've found a primal dual pair of uh, feasible solutions, and they will, of course, satisfy the complementary slackness conditions because that's how we chose y in the first place, so that it did satisfy the CS conditions, and therefore both x and y will be optimal, and in particular x will be optimal. Um, so we will have answered our question. Alternatively, if there is no y that satisfies the corresponding conditions as outlined by the CS conditions, then it could not have been the case that x bar was optimal. So what we're actually doing is we're using the complementary slackness conditions to determine whether or not a single feasible solution for the primal is optimal or not. So let's see if we can actually find a y which satisfies all of these complementary slackness conditions first of all. Uh, okay, and so how would we do that? Well, we need y to satisfy y1 plus y2 minus y3 equals 3, uh, minus y1 minus 3y2 plus 2y3 equals 1, and also y2 equals 0. So these are the three linear equations that the y's must satisfy. The other equations are associated for the x's. But these are for the y's, and you can see that uh, actually, this is a system of linear equations, and so correspondingly, we can solve for this using 
uh, many tools from linear algebra. For instance, we could use Gauss-Jordan elimination uh, or something similar to that. Uh, but actually, I think it's going to be even easier to solve this by hand since we know that y2 will be 0. So we can actually reduce this pretty quickly and we can simplify this uh, down to y1 minus y3 uh, equals 3 and minus y1 plus 2y3 equals 1. Um, since we can just toss out the y2s since they're zeros. All right, and then from here, uh, we could very easily solve for this. One way of doing so is we can add these two constraints together, and what would happen is the y1s will cancel, and two y3s will cancel with minus one y3, and on the left, we'll just be left with y3, one y3, and, uh, and on the right, uh, we'll have the sum of the two right-hand components, which will be four. Uh, and so y3 must be equal to 4. Uh, and so if y3 is 4, then using this constraint right here, uh, y1 minus 4 is 3, so that must mean that y1 is equal to 7. And so then overall, we have uh, the only solution that would actually work here, which is uh, y uh, bar equals uh, 7, the second component is 0, and the third component is 4. Okay, so what we've just done is we've found a y bar that uh, can compensate for the x-bar because the x-bar only satisfied some of the complementary slackness conditions and this y-bar will compensate and satisfy all the rest that it needed to in order for uh, x-bar and y-bar to form a primal dual optimal pair. But I say that assuming that this y-bar is actually feasible, so we should actually check that. Um, so uh, first of all you can notice that uh, since the components of x, uh, neither of which were zero, that meant that the corresponding constraints for the uh, dual variable, uh, uh, sorry, the dual linear program uh, matrix constraints had to hold tight with equality. And so therefore, in particular, they had to be satisfied uh, since they, they were tight, so they held with equality, so we had a greater than or equal to, and they were actually both exactly equal to. So the only thing that we need to check then is whether or not the vector y is non-negative and uh, the components are uh, down here 7, 0, 4, so they're all non-negative. And so therefore, um, y bar equals 7, 0, 4 is a feasible solution and it satisfies, along with x bar, the complementary slackness conditions. And the way we know that is because that's how we determined y bar. We used the constraints as imposed by the CS conditions in order to tell us what y bar must be uh, if it's going to exist at all. And in fact, it does exist, and, and here it is. So, so by complementary slackness, we have that x bar and y bar are a primal dual pair of optimal solutions. And in particular, that means that x bar is an optimal solution for the primal, which was our initial question. So we just kind of get for free um, a optimal solution for the dual as well. This just kind of comes along for the ride. But really, what you should be viewing this y bar as is a certificate. It certifies that x bar is actually optimal for the primal. So we can just write this down below real quick before we conclude. So y bar equals 704, and so therefore um, x bar and y bar are a primal dual optimal pair. And so we were able to determine this using the complementary slackness conditions. And so in particular, this means, so this implies that uh, x bar is in fact an optimal solution. So x bar is optimal for uh, the primal. Okay, and so we've answered our question and uh, we've determined that it is optimal and we were able to do so using the complementary slackness conditions. So again, even though we know that the CS conditions are characterizing optimality for a primal dual pair of linear programs, that's what in principle they do. In practice, we can use them to induce some constraints for us that uh, tell us what a certificate uh, vector would need to satisfy in order to prove that an initial feasible solution for the primal is in fact optimal. So the fact that this y bar exists shows the optimality of the uh, feasible solution that we were given originally. And this is actually uh, the more common usage of the complementary slackness conditions in practice. I would not use them to test whether or not a given pair of solutions is optimal. We have easier ways of determining that using strong duality, as we've already said, but it 
uh, it is used to uh, determine optimality or lack thereof of a single solution, as we've just demonstrated. So this video demonstrates how we would actually use CS conditions in practice, and this justifies why we even brought up these uh, conditions in the first place. Uh, so that concludes it for complementary slackness, and so there's more topics to come, but that's it for this video. So thank you very much for watching.